Okay, WDS. With WDS, you need a WDS server role. And what WDS allows you to do is distribute software over the network. The requirements are, obviously, if you're going to be sending it over a network, you're going to need some sort of switch. That switch is going to have the devices that you want to image. So here's your workstation. Your workstation is going to have an Ethernet connection. And the network card needs to support what? Pixie Yeah, PXE, pre-execution environment, Pixie Boot, which will boot an operating system over the network and load it into RAM. Why do we need to load an operating system into RAM? What are we going to be doing to this workstation? Installing an operating system. Installing an operating system on the hard drive. Hard drive. So therefore we need to have things running in RAM so we do not affect or use the hard drive because we're going to be erasing it and dumping new data on it or new bits onto it. Yes? Won't that require a certain amount of RAM then? Is there a requirement there? It does require a certain amount of RAM. That exact amount, I do not know. But it is small enough that under 512, I'm sure it would still work. I'm sure it would work with maybe 200 to 500 Most meg. Computers nowadays <coughs> yeah, it's pretty small. The, the operating system to do the installation is usually pretty small. I know it's over 248 for sure because that's what we had issues with before. Uh, to over, just over 248, yeah. it should be, yeah, I'm thinking like 368. I don't know why that number is sticking <laughs> in my head, but anyways. So it needs to support Pixie Boot, needs to have a certain amount of RAM, and the goal then is to be able to pull information over the network onto the NIC. Now the network, this is going to be pulled over the network by utilizing um, Unicast. Remember Unicast? Where, you, where each computer is going to have a direct connection to the server to pull the files that it needs. Unless you enable multicast, and if you enable multicast, then your switch needs to support multicast. And multicast allows you to do what? Multiple. Have one stream coming from the server, and then multiple computers connect to that stream and stream the data at that server. So it's not as as taxing on the server as each individual computer, all 500 computers, let's say. Okay, that's a little extreme. Maybe all 100 computers at one time having each their own connection to the server, and the server resources will slow down. So using multicast with lots of computers will be faster than using unicast with lots of computers. Yes? I think it though a switch with multicast capabilities is probably more than one that doesn't have a time, right? Yes. Okay. Yep. Yes. Does uh, multicast have to be configured on the server? Yes. Multicast has to be configured on the server and you have to identify what image will be deployed using multicast. You can change the IP address. There is a configuration tab for multicast. Okay. When you configure the properties of your server, you're welcome to take a look at that, but you're not going to make any changes because we're not going to do that. But oh, okay. you can change the default multicast stream. I didn't know if you had. I wouldn't that. change it. I don't know if you had to set certain IP addresses for that, or you it does use a class D. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, so I'm wondering, technically, if we wanted to try this, could we set up multiple VMs, like maybe three different VMware workstations, and set them all up Pixie Boot, start them all up, and if multicast is enabled, could we theoretically have all yes. of them do that? Yes. Yes, you would have to set up the options under WDS to automatically start an install image and then make sure that that install image is being used or is using multicast to deliver itself as opposed to unicast. So it's something you can play around with if you want to. All right, so back to WDS. WDS server role is going to require Active Directory and DNS 
and DHCP. Why does it need DHCP? Because it needs to assign IP addresses. It needs to assign IP addresses to workstations because right now these workstations are not configured. So they need to automatically obtain an IP address from a DHCP server. That's one reason. The next is it needs to get a DHCP option. I don't know what the option number is, top of my head. I think it's in the 60s, 62, I think, or 60. And to identify what WDS server to pull the boot image from. That takes me to images. We have boot images, <clears throat> install images, and capture images. Boot images are used to do what? Yes. <laughs> Just add something to work with so it can grab something from the network. I don't know. <laughs> it's used during the Pixie boot. So when the operating system needs to be loaded on here in order to proceed with an installation or or capturing an image or deploying an image the very first thing that loads on here after pixie is enabled and it downloads using tftp the boot image comes from the wds server and gets loaded into ram on this workstation that's what the boot image is and that boot image is either going to be depending upon your clients going to be x86 or x64, 64 bit or a 32 bit system. There's an i a 64 when you're looking through it and properties, yeah. i86. Not sure. I haven't messed around with any of those. Yes? What do you have on your WDS server multiple uh, Systems that you can boot up to, like it could be a Windows uh, Home Premium or a Enterprise version of Seven. When you Pixie boot, does it give you the option to say, "Oh, hey, look, there's two different ones you can go from"? Or yes, it will either give you the option, or if it detects that it's a 32-bit system, it'll use the x86 boot image. And the server will determine; it'll know which machine it's going to and which version it wants yeah. to shoot. Yeah, yeah, more than likely, or it'll give you a list, a menu option. Okay, so the boot image, you're going to need a boot image for a 32-bit or 64-bit system. And in here, all the stuff that we're playing with is all 64-bit, and most things today are 64-bit. But you might go to an organization that has older systems. Using older systems, you need to use a 32-bit boot image. Now that you have, what's that? Since they're praying now. <laughs> yeah. Now that you have a boot image, we now can install or add an install image. An install image is essentially the copy of the OS, the operating system DVD installer. So when you purchase uh, Windows 7 or Windows 8, you get, a, uh, you get it delivered to you on DVD. On that DVD is an install image that Microsoft created that you can add to your WDS server, which is essentially a copy of that DVD. So you can install an operating system from your WDS server without using a physical DVD. Or you can do it over multiple systems and having only one physical DVD. And then, of course, you're going to need licensing for all of this as well, but that's beyond what we're talking about here. So what we do is we add that and it's typically on the sources folder on the DVD. So in the sources folder is where you're going to find both the boot image and an install image. And depending upon what the DVD comes with, it might have multiple versions so it might have Windows 7 
Pro, Windows 7 Enterprise, Windows 7 Home, Windows 7 Home Premium. It might have all of those, or it just might have one, depending upon what you have for the install media that you're, you're pulling from. So we can have multiple <laughs> install images on a <clears throat> WDS server. You can have an install image for Windows 7, you can have an install image for Windows Server, you can have an install image for Windows 8, or even Windows Vista if you wanted to go crazy. <laughs> so install images give you the ability to install an operating system where you would actually click through a wizard and click next, 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 and answer some questions in order to do the installation. Any questions about this one? This can be automated if you use an auto install XML file. This is an XML file that has all of these questions that are asked during the wizard that will automatically be answered for you so you don't have to click next, next, next. It'll automatically do all the steps that you intend to do. That's nice, especially if you're installing it on a bunch of new systems. The next really cool thing, which we're not going to get into here, but we'll talk about it just so you're familiar with it, is a capture image. A capture image allows us to actually capture software that's already installed on the workstation and bring it to the server. So the workstation already has an operating system installed. It already has Firefox and Chrome. It already has our customer service management software. It has our all of our software that our organization uses. Already pre-installed, pre-configured, pre-licensed. Everything is beautifully set up. It is a master golden install of everything that we use. And then we capture it. So the, the idea is to grab that, a copy of that hard drive. So here's our hard drive. And what we're going to do with the capture is if we boot this workstation with Pixie using the capture image, it will then prompt us for which hard drive do you want to capture? We say we want to capture this hard drive, the only hard drive in our system, and we want to store it, a copy of it, a copy of the hard disk drive is now stored on our server. And then we can take that copy of the hard drive and it now becomes an install image that we can deploy to all the other workstations in our organization and now they will all be identical. There are some things you need to do though prior to doing this. One of them that I'm going to mention here, and this is as far as I'm going to go into it unless you have questions. Is to sysprep this hard drive or this workstation prior to capturing this image. That will erase the identity of this Windows installation on this computer and allow this captured image to be deployed to multiple workstations, multiple devices of different manufacturers, different RAM, different processors, and it will automatically create a new identity as if it were an out-of-box experience. So you don't install it on another computer and it has its identity, so the hardware that it thinks it has will be... It won't work. It will, it yeah, as it boots up for the first time, after running SysPrep on it, as it boots up for the first time on this new hardware, it'll search the hardware and go, what do I got? What do I got? What drivers do I need to install? Oh, okay. And then create that SID, that system ID, that keeps it unique from any other computer on the network as far as the Windows operating system goes. <clears throat> and it will be an out-of-box experience, you know, like when you take a new computer out of the box, you turn it on, it asks you, what's your name? What do you want to name the computer? What, do you, what color do you like? 
You know, all those kind of questions. So that's the out-of-box experience that you get. And what it's doing is, it is identifying itself and trying to figure out what hardware is actually in the system. So when you do that, we can capture an image like that. So how do you uh, do the verification of all those programs and stuff that have been installed on there to authenticate them? Like, you know, because you're going to have use this one computer and it's all set up and it has Word on it and all this other stuff. And then you're going to put it on 20 other computers. I mean, you got to authenticate with Microsoft that those are all legit copies and you paid them. So you would do that prior to capturing the image. The well, only identity on that's other machines does you have the, to re, then re a new code in. The or? licensing that you use in an organization that would proceed to use capturing and deploying images will have licensing that supports multiple installs. So once it's already licensed on the one when you did the push it'll be licensed all on all the others. Yes. Uh, one of the things I mentioned Aaron is is Licensing isn't always just putting digits in a box. Licensing is, can be done other ways. For instance, licensing servers are very common. A lot of organizations, the, the program will go out to see if it's licensed. So you don't always have to stick it in the box. Just yeah, do it you're used to it. consumer software, consumer versions of software. You have to type in a key code. That's not always the case. If, if I purchase a copy of Office. So the Microsoft Office that our school uses, you don't have to type a key code in. The key code is already built into the installation. Mm -hmm. So all you need is the to install it on a computer and it's already licensed. There's no registration, there's none of that jazz. But for other things that you might install that want you to register and it's freeware that you can install, then it creates a temporary file on the computer and there's some tricks and tips to having to go into a certain folder, copy those registry keys, or copy those files into the all users folder on Windows 7. So Windows 7, Windows 8 has an all users. If you look under the home directory or the users directories, there's an all users in there. And what that does is anytime a new user is created, these are the settings and files that every new user gets. So if you put those files in there, anytime a new user logs into this computer, they'll get those settings that tell that application, you're already registered, stop whining about it and making the user try to register again. Does that make sense? Yeah, so that's essentially a profile, uh, an all users profile. Is that good questions? Any others? Yes. But for like a, a large company, you still have to buy the number of licensing Absolutely. For each computer that you're going to have. If you're going to image this and you're going to image the software to all the computers, you need to make sure the software that you install on this computer is licensed to be running on that many computers. Absolutely. Licensing is a very important aspect of imaging. If you're going to image for a school district, image for a business, you have to make sure you have the licensing. And as Dana was pointing out, licensing is not always that key that you type into the program. It is also a piece of paper in a filing cabinet or a server that maintains licenses for those products. If I remember right, you also mentioned that you can have one copy of that software, but you have to let the people from Microsoft or where you purchase it from know how many computers yeah. you That's called the select licensing select. that Microsoft has. And Microsoft has a lot of different licensing options for any type of organization. So. We could spend a whole three credit class talking about different licensing features that Microsoft offers oh, wow. and get into each particular one. But depending on the organization you go work for, it would be a waste of your time to learn about other licensing features that you're not going to utilize. Right. So yeah, there's a lot of options. Any other questions? So today what we're going to do is we're going to install the WDS service. It's going to use Active Directory, which of course needs DNS, that's why we need this. It's going to utilize Active Directory to make sure it's there, utilize DHCP and make sure that we can hand out IP addresses and tell these clients where to download the boot image from. And then we're going to deploy the image, which is just a simple install image, just so we can see this process occur. Okay? Any other questions? Thank you.